Uh, so um, welcome, everyone, uh, to our conversation about craft criticism and writing. And we hope that this conversation will provoke many other debates and questions uh, in the hours ahead. So I'm here today with Sarah Archer on my left, who is a Philadelphia-based writer and independent curator uh, whose writing appears in Hyperallergenic, the Journal of Modern Craft, Studio Potter, Huffington Post, Slate, New Yorker Online, and Washington Post. And as you just heard, her new book, Mid-Century Christmas, is um, having its sneak preview in the uh, ACC library, but it will be on the shelves in bookstores next week. And uh, on my right, uh, William Warmus, who is a fellow and former curator at the Corning Museum of Glass, uh, where he, and he is also the founding editor of the New Glass Review. Um, William, who's based in Ithaca, New York, is the author of more than a dozen books and <clears throat> is an Urban Glass uh, board member. So we've had the pleasure of meeting a few times already. So we've had a few sneak uh, um, conversations of our own in thinking, getting to know one another. And so we'd like to kick off this conversation um, by arguing that the field of critical writing on craft is, is very much in transition and it has shifted away from its legacy of the writer as a champion of medium-specific artists and their virtuosic works written exclusively from, for a specialized audience. And instead, what, we're, um, what we feel is, has happened is that critical craft writing has increasingly become a mode of thinking through the multiple ways that craft actually functions in uh, today's world. And more often than not, critical writing now um, focuses on how craft expresses, enhances, or critically challenges aspects of our daily lives in a, within a very complex globalized arena. So it's perhaps that tendency <clears throat> uh, towards embracing a broader cultural perspective on craft that may help to illuminate the, um, the first question that we'd like to begin with this morning, which is namely, um, what makes someone decide to write critically about craft in 2016? So <laughs> I am going to um, ask each of you, um, how has critical writing and craft uh, and research on craft um, you know, been a compelling activity for each of you, both at the beginning of your career and, and now today? Great. May I have the clicker, please? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. We're ready. Here we go. Um, what you're looking at is a cover of Ocean Realm magazine. It has a picture of an octopus. Um, I like to show this because it's not a uh, <clears throat> it's not a real octopus. It's a glass octopus, and that's what makes it interesting to me. It was made in the 1890s by um, some figures known as uh, glass makers known as the Blaschkas. And I use this as an example of the way criticism was at the beginning of my career in the 1970s. We were really focused on. Um, a formal sort of criticism. I was very much enamored with the writings of Clement Greenberg at that time. So we were looking at things as good, better, and best. And the octopus is a great thing to use because you, you can have what seem to be real direct criteria. Does it look like an octopus or not? So if it really does and it fools you, then it's successful. That would be my formal analysis of that. You fast forward to today, and this is a whale made by Raven Sky River. He's a young uh, Seattle area artist and um, indigenous American background. And I think you can still do all of the same sorts of formal analysis. You can look at the eye on the right and say, okay, the eye is placed exactly where it should be. It couldn't be placed anywhere else. But already in the work of Sky River, even though he's a very traditional studio artist, He's dealing with issues of ecology, for example, and the preservation of the environment in the um, figures he makes. So you have to go a little bit beyond formal analysis. And I found it increasingly difficult in my career as a freelancer to um, just use formal analysis as a critical tool. I, I think it's been breaking down recently. So I've struggled a lot with how do I get out of that formal analysis? You noticed I crossed my feet because I'm trying to be less formal now. 
Um, but seriously, um, in my case, I won't go into it in much detail, but I began um, a career as a scuba diver in order to do some videos underwater for a client. And out of that, <clears throat> I observed that there is a particular form of evolution called reticulate evolution. Coral evolved that way. And it's not hierarchical. It's not a tree structure. It's more of a web structure. So rather than a tree, you go to a web. And looking at coral and the way they evolve, I thought to myself, wow, you know, I could apply that to my art criticism. Instead of trying to say, is this piece by Christina Bothwell good, better, or be best? Is it better than the uh, Raven Sky River whale, for example? That made no sense to me. What you do do is you try to describe it in terms of um, how it blends styles together. In this case, this is a good example because you have an octopus and a figure blended together. So I've been looking at moving away from formal analysis, trying to move towards a more uh, web-based reticulate analysis. And for my final comment on that, it's helpful, for example, when I go through a show like um, Art Basel and you see this beautiful big glass cube about the size of this chair by the artist Ai Weiwei. Um, 30 years ago, we would have looked at that and said, wow, technically that's amazing. It's beautiful as a formal object, but it's not really enough today. That's been done. Um, it, it goes beyond that. In this case, the Ai Weiwei relates to his ideas of minimalism and the condensation of matter. Some of you may know his ton of tea. It's a big cube of tea that weighs a ton. This glass block is part of that series, if you will. Um, the telling moment for me was when a, collect a glass collector looked at it and said, but it has chips along the edge. I would never buy it. It's broken. And what it really was was part of Weiwei's working style that you know, it gets developed in the factory. It has chips because of being moved along the factory floor. It's an example for me of how we need to move beyond formalism to a kind of more complete analysis. So partly out of frustration with that kind of analysis, in 2010, I, uh, Tim Tate and I seceded from Studio Glass. We just left the field. We said, we've got to leave this. We're going to do something else, and we found it a, a Facebook page called Glass Secessionism, which was um, maybe representative of my total break from my old formalist roots, um, beginning of my career, but not a complete break as we'll see later. So that's where I'm at. And all of these things throughout my career, I should just say, have been fascinating for me. It's been fun to write about them in this way and to try to be aware of the different devices you can develop for looking at, at art. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So the reticulate is really the metaphor then for the need to go beyond the, the medium and also beyond the conversation about aesthetics outside of its relationships to the meanings that, and the systems that it is part of. Yes. And I think it, it's scary because everything gets much messier. I think we talked about that yesterday. Yeah. When, you're, when you feel like your duty is not just to say whether this is a really good octopus by comparing it with pictures of octopuses, or octopodes, um, you, 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 you go out and say, well, the whole world is my set of criteria, and I have to draw from that. It's kind of scary and, and difficult to know how to find your way. Would you like this? I would love that. Sarah, what about you? You, you come from a, a, having worked for about 10 years now in the field, right? Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, my path to being a nearly full-time writer, which I, I suppose I am nowadays. Um, because it was a little bit circuitous, and I think the, ex the experiences that I had before that really inform what I'm doing now. I uh, finished up my master's at the Bard Graduate Center in 2006, and after a period of time working um, at the Museum of Arts and Design, I took a job at Greenwich House Pottery, and I was working as, I think it was called, it was a job called Programs Manager, but sort of like everybody who works at a small nonprofit, it was sort of everyone does like 10 things, it was that kind of job. and. Um, my first published piece of writing was a direct outgrowth of, of this position. I had just come back from uh, my Bard class had gone, uh, this is pre-2008, this is the good old days, went on a month-long trip to Amsterdam and Paris just because that's what 
you did if you were a first year MA. Um, and we had seen all these wonderful things like um, Dutch dollhouses that were sort of commissioned by wealthy adult women and designed and kind of furnished by their real life decorators but in miniature. And a few years go by, I'm working at Greenwich House and we have, there's a show opening up, the first one that was happening when I was there, um, by a Michigan based artist named Sarah Lindley who had created these black porcelain like skeletal sculptures based on Dutch cabinet houses. And I was like, oh my God, like what are the odds that I, you know, she's doing this, she's interested in this and it's so interesting. And she approached, um, it's a wonderful woman who was the director at the time, Elizabeth Sawada, and said, as this, this conversation always goes, I'd love somebody to write about my work. You know, how should we, like, who should we talk to? And I was <laughs> literally like sitting at the next computer and Liz was like, well, what about Sarah? And that was the first thing I ever published. It was this sort of article about um, tracing some of the history of the source object and then exploring the way a contemporary artist was kind of mining that history and reinterpreting it. And I didn't know it then, but that's kind of what I've done ever since. Like I, the writing that I've done tends to be very concerned with how artists working in the present day are kind of inspired by, riffing off of, um, arguing against you know, historical materials and in really creative and interesting ways. And luckily for me, a lot of people are doing that very well. So um, when I think back on that and then sort of think to, you know, it's almost 10 years later, um, how much the, the field and the world has changed because Ceramics Art and Perception is a wonderful publication that is probably not likely to be read by people who don't like subscribe to Ceramics Art and Perception. So it's a fairly circumscribed audience, right? It's not gonna be kind of, it's unlikely to go viral, shall we say. Um, and now I can write, I could write a version of that same article for Hyperallergic and it could be shared and retweeted by people I've never met and people who aren't necessarily interested in ceramics per se, mm -hmm. but might be interested in the image or you know, click on the image because it looks fascinating and it can reach an audience of kind of art and culture people who are interested who haven't sought out ceramics as a medium. So th this is kind of, I think for me it's been, and I think for the artists as well, a really wonderful development of kind of boundary crossing. Mm -hmm. um, so in a, in a way that kind of leads to the role that, that social media has really played. played. Because, yes. um, I mean, I remember writing on craft, I, I'm kind of in between the two of you in terms of the, the, my own ge uh, generational position and historical position in that I remember when I was coming up in the 80s um, learning it, like formalist criticism it was still being taught, but it had been kind of supplanted by more of a Marxist approach of like talking about the social uh, context of work. But we always sort of had to understand the power of Clement Greenberg and the idea of talking about um, you know, uh, form and color and texture and scale and all of those kinds of um, things, uh, but also linking it to mm -hmm. other issues in the world. So what I'm wondering, mm -hmm. since you're bringing up the, the fact that now your writing can be distributed to such a wider audience, whether you actively distribute it on your own or whether others tag it and then send it off, I'm wondering if we could look at this question about how um, has the rise of global social media uh, impacted the way you write? Because it's one thing when you can assume a body of knowledge because it's already a specialized audience. It's another thing when you don't even know who that audience might be because you don't know who's going to pick it up, tag it, and then distribute it to, um, I don't know, the uh, Marine Biology Association yes. um, if you're going to be talking about Blaschka. Right. So I wonder if you can say a little bit more about how it's affected yeah. your writing. And then, you know, we can also look a little bit at how social media has impacted our understanding of the craftsperson's role in society. Oh, definitely. And I think, yeah, both of those are, are very much the case. In fact, um, the, believe it or not, the first piece that I ever wrote for Hyperallergic was inspired by a conversation thread on Facebook. And it was, um, Early in 2014, and it was um, the Whitney Biennial was up in New York, and there were there were it was the year that they had three people, so there was sort of the middle, yeah. the one on the middle was um, heavily 
Uh, Michelle Grabner's floor sort of heavily crafty. There were uh, lots of different media, and it was this really kind of wonderful array of things. There was a lot of um, sloppy craft going on, and so there were lots of feelings about sloppy craft and what that means. And there, this thread unfolded on, I believe, um, Critical Craft Forum, the wonderful online now podcast website, Facebook uh, destination Thank you, founded. Thank you, Namita and Elizabeth Agro, yeah. uh, Namita Wiggers. And it was this fascinating conversation, which probably still exists somewhere in the archives of Facebook, about what it meant and why there was this sort of funny assemblage of like these super duper precise Jim Mason um, sculptures next to the, the Sterling Ruby sculptures, which like even for people who are huge fans, they, they're a hot mess. Like they look, they're just all over the place and yeah. that's why a lot of people love them, but they're also very kind of like candle waxy, kind of drippy, messy. Um, people who were really had, the, I had the sense reading their commentary that they felt like they'd been sort of punched in the gut. Like how can a major institution yeah. be, think that this is what we as a community are doing? And I think what I wanted to say but didn't say in that article or didn't say in that thread but then said I'm hyperallergic is that they're not. They're not thinking about the clay community at all. Like that isn't part of the, the, the equation for good or for ill. So I pitched this idea to, the, to my editor and kind of said, um, there is, you may not be aware of this, but there's like all of these feelings. There's this whole debate about sort of what does it belong there? Why do people in the art world not know that this is sort of bad with a capital B? And it's, you know, and then other people in the clay community who are saying kind of, you know, it's not bad, it's good, it's interesting, it's important to have this diversity, yada, yada. So it was this whole really fascinating debate. And I never would have been able to write that article without Facebook, which I know sounds kind of goofy, but it's really true. Because mm -hmm. it, it was getting to see an unvarnished, really thoughtful conversation kind of back and forth between, you know, maybe 20 different people. Um, and then I was able to reach out to a lot of those folks by email and say, can I interview you? Can I ask these questions? And then present this, um, you know, a few different viewpoints about what these, what the meaning of the presence of this work is. And, um, you know, why it is that there seems to be this love of kind of gestural abandon in contemporary art ceramics that real kind of skilled, uh, technically masterful potters have a tough time wrapping their brain around like why that's desirable. So yeah. that from that point forward, most of the pieces or many of the pieces that I've written for Hyperallergic kind of explore that um, dialogue between communities as much as they talk about the objects themselves. Uh -huh. That's interesting. And how about social media for you, Bill? I know your reticulate metaphor, in fact, points to the web, right? Oh, yeah, it definitely. points to systems of distribution and new uh, kinds of connectivities. So how, how has this affected the it's way you a, write? a big impact. Um, I was sitting with my wife at home very happily one day a few years ago, and she said, you know, you've written books about all the major figures in Studio Glass, or a lot of them, but you know nothing about what's going on in Studio Glass today. I won't tell you where that argument went. <laughs> I completely disagreed with her. I said, you're crazy. I, I'm an expert. I realized that I... Then thinking about it, I realized I had no clue as to where Studio Glass was going. Um, Facebook gave me a lot of clues, and one reason I showed the work re just now of Sky River and um, Bothwell was that those artists were artists I discovered on Facebook going through things, and I discovered I was very interested in them, I wanted to follow up with that. Yeah. So I really learned a lot about it. Uh -huh. But even more than that, once it came time to write the articles, I have started um, publishing parts of my articles on Facebook as tests. I'll, I'll publish a paragraph or a few sentences to see what the public reaction is to it, to see if I'm making sense or if maybe people have some other ideas. Uh -huh. So I think it's a great way um, not just to find out about things but to test the waters with writing. Uh -huh. So it's almost like the group critique that was talked about yesterday, right? You, you put something out and then you see mm -hmm. how it's actually being read. Yeah, it's a way of actually um, group sourcing yeah. something, although I don't usually give those people credit yeah. in my essay because I feel they might not want credit. In, in you know, it, what you were talking about in terms of like coming across an artist um, because you're, you're surfing the web, uh, it, it, it kind of points to just how different the role of the critic is and the critical writer is now in relationship <clears throat> to the more traditional institutions that have been the gatekeepers for artworks too, right? So it isn't even that you've, you happen to see a work in a gallery, 
you know, that's already made it into that space, and then you feel the need to write about it. I mean, there is there is just this plethora of of um, types of work that exist out there. I I think though that um, you know when we think about to come back to the second part of this, you know, this idea of the uh, craftsperson's role in society because of social media. I mean, clearly that's you know just the fact that you can be your own kind of method of distribution now. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's not the same as the sort of support system that a gallery will offer and the kind of um, maybe knocking on your door to say, will you write about so-and-so, which happens as part of the gallerist's job. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, you know, it's not necessarily in place of, but it is in a, alongside, right? So, and I know yeah. you, in, when we spoke earlier, you had other ideas about, about this idea of the role and how the, how the whole social media thing has really um, changed you know, how artists Yeah, work. You, do, you mean vis-a-vis -vis like sort of hiding away from the world versus kind of being yeah. up front? Yeah, I think that there's, I mean, one of the things that is very central to kind of the studio craft movement certainly is this notion of kind of getting away and kind of going to Maine or going to the mountains of whichever state your, your craft school is in and kind of taking a break to, from ordinary time and doing something that feels kind of deliberately a little bit low tech and sort of enjoying the simple life for a few weeks or a lifetime if you happen to be a rural uh, crafter of some kind. And I think that there's a funny way in which even if you actually do live you know, in the woods or somebody, but you have, you know, a number, you have enough bars to, to kind of communicate with the world, you can be um, sharing short video clips of your studio practice on Instagram and anybody in the world can see it. And so that, I think because we're living through it, we sometimes forget how profound that change is and that, artists um, even, not in lieu of having a gallery, because it's a complex set of relationships that that affords and, and builds for an artist, but um, to have that kind of presence is incredibly freeing for, for a young artist, and to have the ability to kind of write their own story visually, and um, I sometimes write about people who don't have galleries because I think their work is interesting, and I might come across them on Instagram or on you know a website or, or what have you. So I think that this idea of, um, physical location as a form of cultural, of kind of like dropping out and, you know, not being part of your bourgeois system man and kind of going to the, you know, whatever, the mountains, is less, much less relevant than it was and that no matter where you live, you can really be um, actively engaged with a, a robust art community digitally. Uh-huh. So, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by, uh, you know, thinking about Mark Shapiro's comment yesterday about that, that act of working um, in yeah. solitude in a space at or a semi, slow semi pace yeah. as a kind of um, radical act in yeah. this day yeah, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that you're not also occasionally tweeting or posting yeah. on Instagram, or tweeting Or all the time, yeah. yeah. So it, it, I yeah. think that it, yeah. it complicates the idea of, Absolutely. of what a radical act entails or embraces. Um, I wanted to speak to the idea that um, we as critics, published critics, have access to certain things that uh, are not available online for the most part, sort of traditional things that are really important. One is a good editor. Yeah. If we're, you know, I mean, that doesn't exist online yet. Maybe it will. But we have editors usually that we've been working with for a long time who can really help us. They're there to make us look as good as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is um, what we talked about, my idea of secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. The idea that uh, if you have a, a big library at home <clears throat> or access to one, you have access to a lot of written documents that are not online and maybe never will be online. Yeah, I think that that's, I know in, with my students, I think sometimes there's this, um, this kind of myth that now everything is online or that, you know, a Google search will enable you to access anything important about a topic or all of the various links that you can that can take you off into different directions but you know in fact if you have a, a library like this or if you have a lifetime of experiences of conversations with other people you very quickly realize just like what huge gaps exist mm -hmm. right in and the it, knowledge base that is afforded to you through digital it, means it's led to some myths for example there's a myth in the glass community that there's very little critical writing about glass, studio glass, when in fact there are hundreds of articles that have been written. <clears throat> They're just spread across the world in obscure publications, and it's really hard to get to them. 
So the obscure, is that an argument for um, digitizing the obscure publications? Or? Well, ultimately, yes. Yeah. I mean, I actually think that that's a role that a, a critical thinker and, um, you know, a kind of cultural activist in our field, it, it really is about, about trying to reveal and make accessible a lot of the stuff that has um, been in the shadows, right? Right. And sometimes I think that that... I mean, your, your point about secret knowledge, I love that kind of sexy <laughs> term. It's gonna let's find out how to reveal it, you know, but it's, um, it reminded me a lot about, of uh, a really fascinating book by Gregory Cholette called Dark Matter, Art and Politics in the Age of Enterprise. And he talks about how, you know, the art world makes you think that there are these constellations of stars, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and there are these bright stars that get all the attention and all, all the critics want to write about those people and it's, right. you know, we all know the names and um, it exists. But his argument about dark matter, which is actually taken a metaphor from, um, you know, the uh, astronomical community and the people who are studying the actual skies above, that, you know, for every star, there's all of this dark matter that is actually totally surrounding it. And the star would not be shining if the dark matter didn't support it. And so there, there are, are multitudes of forms of craft practice and bodies of knowledge, more kinds of secret knowledges that have been flourishing all along, you know. And it isn't just that they're hidden away in a library, um, but it's that they haven't yet been valued. And so when I think about, um, you know, the implications for, for example, for diversity in our field, mm -hmm. for really um, looking at the fact that um, often, you know, marginalized communities in society have very exciting and fabulous craft practices that may not yet have had the lights shown on them mm -hmm. in the way. And I, so I also think it kind of points to the role of um, the critic and the writer and the researcher to really try to find and broaden the scope of what is the field right now. And I think that's actually one of the things that, <clears throat> to sort of mention that highlight reel, the wonderful kind of clip reel that we saw yesterday of ACC, um, these jewels from the library to highlight that that's one of the most crucial things that the ACC can do for the field is digitizing and making accessible this wealth of kind of analog or sort of old school material. Jessica Shaykhead has been, um, they told me that they, they have had this sort of trove of, I guess it's reel to reel tape and they digitize things sometimes that were even unmarked and then it would turn out to be this like fascinating you know, footage of an artist in 1971 talking about glass blowing or what have you. And it's this um, material that rounds out, fills in the interstitial spaces that sit between kind of the pedestaled object and the object label. It's this, this wealth of context right. that invariably enriches any critical writing that a, a person would want to do, including, you know, anywhere from grad students to seasoned critics and everybody in between. So I think that's, I want to just kind of give a, a, a personal plug to that initiative on the part of the ACC and, you know, any other organizations that are kind of headed that way. It's really crucially important. Yeah. Well, particularly as, um, you know, there, I, I'm saying this as, a, as somebody who teaches a lot, but like if you give a student the choice of watching a video or reading a chapter, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it is very, it's, yeah, it's a tough sell. To, it's a tough to, sell. Uh, yeah. <laughs> more and more, although I really push for the book. Um, but I think they do different kinds of work and they see it in different ways. Yeah, and they humanize a lot of um, things that come from a different time period that a, that a student might be kind of, you know, feel uneasy about or have no sense of personal connection. There's something about seeing somebody just being a human being on film kind of in a relaxed way that's instantly connective yeah. that I think can, can go a long way towards sort of connecting students with, with a body of work. Okay, um, I wanna talk about what critics learn mm. from artists mm. because um, there are a lot of craft artists because you know, as we're talking about you know, the need to um, look for, you know, think politically in the sense of where the holes are, um, find things that haven't been spoken, bring to light, chapters and books and interesting things that haven't been said. I mean, there are a lot of craft artists today who are developing strategies that are really allowing them to critique global labor practices, wealth inequality, historical social struggles, ecological crises, and the rarefied sphere of luxury goods. So, you know, 
I'm really wondering with all of those kinds of strategies, and I think it becomes the role of the critic also to both understand those strategies, to probe them, to um, find the holes in them, et cetera. I, you know, so what, what is it that, that artists are doing that help us write differently or write in more complex and interesting ways for more multiple audiences? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand this to you because I know you have something you wanna talk about Secret on Secret knowledge, here we go, let's see. There we go. Um, well, this is an example of, um, oop, is it doing it automatically? Okay, I'll leave it. There we go. Um, an artist who is mining decorative arts history in a way that I find really compelling and really fascinating. And I, um, it always kind of sort of makes my heart sing as a porcelain nerd about the, when I see an artist sort of do, doing something like this. The object that you see on the left is an original version of the Century Vase, which was, um, there are multiple versions of this in various museums, but it was commissioned um, for the centennial, the original centennial in Philadelphia, 1876, the World's Fair. And it is a kind of um, celebration of all things American and fabulous. There's lots of technological um, innovations, the, the sewing machine, the telegraph, all sorts of you know, Gilded Age wonders depicted, and of course, George Washington. Um, animals and plants from different parts of North America. And uh, the artist Roberto Lugo has um, studied and kind of absorbed and critiqued the message of this vase in all sorts of really interesting ways, starting with uh, the one that you see right next to it, which is the, ben the uh, Benjamin Franklin version, which is kind of a, a Wu-Tang slash Philadelphia colonial um, riff on that. And I think um, this is one of the examples of where having a background in the history of the decorative arts it comes in really handy for writing about this kind of material because I think that although his work is almost, it seems to be almost universally affecting, people seem to be really drawn to it, it's very graphic, provocative, very moving. Um, if you know and understand the research that he did, um, it kind of, it, for one thing, gives you an enormous amount of respect for somebody who has both kind of the intellectual chops and the ability to fabricate something really compelling, but also to kind of um, weave together a critique of our society through objects and kind of an unbroken chain that is, is very powerful. So that's, that was the wrong way. Let's see, there we go, forward. There we go. <gasps> oh no, okay, oh, it went dark. It went, this one went dark for a second and I panicked. Um, so he has a number of different iterations of this form, and there's um, sort of a close-up of, you'll see Cornell West and various other um, iconographic figures. I think I have learned um, to kind of let down my guard about things like graffiti and, you know, kind of embrace a mixing of um, aesthetics and traditions that don't necessarily go together, but um, make a certain amount of sense in the, in the body of a single artist's work. Push this forward a little bit. And the other key part of this is, of course, the rest of Roberto's practice, which comprises um, some of his public speaking. He gave a very well known and beautiful speech at Ensica in 2015, detailing his path to ceramics, which is fairly unusual. He comes from a tremendously disadvantaged background and didn't start studying ceramics until he was 25 at a community college. And a professor complimented him on his technique and said, you're really good at this. And that um, is something that upper middle class and middle class kids get told all the time from you know, a very young age that we, we try lots of stuff and people say, hey, you're really good at that. You could do this one day. And he comes from a background where nobody says that to anybody. That's, you know, he was sort of um, on, in a certain way on his own in this path and wants to be that person for other people in the world. And so it's not just about fabricating objects that tell a story, but it's about making the story happen by being an educator and sharing his story with a wide audience on YouTube, in the classroom, um, working with, with kids, with seniors, you know, with college students and everybody in between. So, you know, I mean that, so if you're gonna write about his work then, I mean, if, if his practice is very specifically um, not limited to making objects mm -hmm. alone, <clears throat> but that he defines as a practice what it means to be a potter today is, is, uh, is more complex than that or is, is, um, involves the act of um, talking about mm -hmm. what clay can do in, in an individual life or how he teaches, then how, you know, what is that, 
What do you need to know, um, or how, what kinds of things do you have to research in order to talk about the full spectrum of the practice more fully? I mean, do you have to, like, talk about the teaching? Is it, do you have to kind of honor the total um, spectrum of what he's doing and witness the, the way in which he interacts with people? Or do That's you feel a really that? That's a good question. I know? think that it's, it, well, first you have, I mean, if you're writing about kind of what it means to be a potter today, because I think that there's, Formalism as a critical tool might be out of fashion, but there's nothing really wrong with it. I mean, it's, it's functional pots are, can be great and fabulous and fascinating and wonderful in all kinds of ways. It's just they tend not to be um, clickbait. So it's the kind of narrative, uh, sort of provocative imagery that we associate with a lot of things that get written about on the web is um, if things are marginalized, um, it might be because uh, it's, they happen to be um, visually quite subtle in a way that doesn't translate well to kind of a web-based platform. But in writing about Roberto, I actually didn't write, when I, when I wrote about him for Hyperallergic, I didn't kind of delve hugely into his um, educational practice. Mostly I talked about the fact that his path was very unusual for ceramics, which tends to be, um, I, I wouldn't say genteel, but perhaps like a more, it, you know, it, it, you don't sort of fall into it typically. You know, you have to study and take classes and be exposed to it. So. I think that the responsibility of a critic is to sort of know your audience, know what's relevant to the work itself. Um, I don't think you need to know that he's an educator to appreciate his riffs on the century vase. I think it helps to know what the century vase is. Yeah. Um, but certainly when you find out about all the other work he's doing, it, it underscores the power of those works. So I think it's, it's a matter of degrees and also, one article, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not a book, right? It's right. not sort of a book length manuscript. It'll cover, um, it's, you know, it would be interesting for somebody to write about him on um, a political website like Vox, you know, that doesn't have to do with objects per se. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the clicker, there you go. Um, yes, take it away. From. I wonder, <laughs> Bill, if there's something that, that you could say about, I mean, we, this is another one of his pots, um, and specifically about the border crossing and the kind of um, travails of immigration in this country, but not limited to this country. So I'm just wondering, you know, I think his, his work by its very nature and its subject matter and his practice as somebody who understands it as activist, um, you know, really does pull you into having to know more about the subjects that the work is about and, and learning about that. I'm wondering two things, if, if that is something that um, resonates in your own writing in terms of how you have um, had to research things to write about particular works, and also, is there something still valuable about formalist critique that could be applied here? Yeah, I think there is. You know, I really think that this work holds up formally, and I'm not sure if it didn't, how powerful the work would be. Mm -hmm. I think that it has to have a strong formal basis. We're gonna talk a little later about Theaster Gates, mm -hmm. and that's a whole, whole different subject that's mm -hmm. probably not susceptible to formal analysis. So I think that you could look at a Greek vase and you can look at the Lugo piece and you can compare them together with the same methodology. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay, so I, I, I do, you know, I, I would make the argument that you do actually need to find out about what it is you're going to be pointing to if an artist is pointing you there. Like, then you better find out more about the politics of the immigration as it's playing out today. Or um, if you're gonna talk about, decide to talk about the teaching, then maybe you really need to kind of witness what the interactions are rather than assuming what it means to be a teacher in an mm -hmm. environment like that. So I think, it, for me, it also makes it um, more exciting um, mm -hmm. to think about how to be slightly more embedded in the artist's practice um, and really dig deeper into the, um, the, the connectivities that yeah. that person is, is provoking you to I, I do have to remind you that we talked about this yesterday, too, yeah. that um, even back in the 70s when I was working on, for example, the work of Emile Gallet, yeah. my favorite French Art Nouveau glass artist, um, he was very active in the Dreyfus Affair, which is a, a, a issue about anti-Semitism at the late 19th century France. So I had to know a lot about the Dreyfus Affair in order to prepare my book yeah. and do it. So I, it's, not that, it's not really that this method of analysis is brand new today. It's just that we have um, so many more tools for um, researching the analysis. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, you know, when, once you start thinking about the practice of the teaching, for example, or the working with um, uh, the kids or the um, older folks that um, you just showed us Lugo doing, you start to also think about projects that are socially engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's often something, you know, those projects, not always, but can often downplay skill levels mm -hmm. sure. um, and invite multiple skill levels to the table so that, you, you know, you're creating, the goal is more about creating a sociability or a particular kind of critical dialogue. Um, and that, that sometimes can upend a lot of the criteria that we've used for, for writing about work. So I just wanted to show, you know, there's a, um, uh, a project that is right now opening up at, at the um, Museum of Art and Design in New York, and many of you have probably seen it. It's been at the Cooper Hewitt and many other places around the country and the world, the Wertheim Sisters um, Crochet Coral Reef. And it's the kind of um, project that is uh, absolutely about, um, you know, inviting multiple levels of skill uh, to make the, uh, to crochet, um, literally to drop the stitch that produces the parabolic curve that um, mimics uh, the life forms underwater, not only to just experience the happiness of making that, but to make it together, to help each other get better at it, um, but also to bring together mathematicians, mm -hmm. scientists, crafters, et cetera, and, um, and to, to use that making forum as a space for talking about climate change. And so that the conversation is also always about inviting the scientists in to talk about what's actually happening in the great coral reef in off the coast of Australia and what's happening in the oceans um, in general. So I think that um, this idea of, of like, how do you write about a project like that? And what do you, you know, how do you decide if it's successful? Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, what, what do you end up focusing on is a, uh, is a big part of it because the process is so essential. And the dialogue, the dialogical component, is really where the real work resides, even though you've got the, um, the vestiges and the beauty of the, the things that are made by these multiple audiences. So this idea yeah, of I, writing about collaboration is, is something that I, is I love the richness of the ecosystem here. And um, I use that in terms of art as well, that um, if you go to major museums, you'll see an impoverished ecosystem, which has just painting and sculpture and no other media. But when we dive on coral reefs, we don't want to see just sharks. We want to see the little corals and the shrimp and so on. And I think this project is fascinating to me because it's a very rich ecosystem. Obviously, there's some people who are going to crochet beautifully. And there's some people like me who, you know, would make something that wouldn't even look like it was crocheted. But nonetheless, the project accepts all of those into its system. So as a critic, I would jump right on this and just say I could write so much about this in terms of that. It um, would seem very alien 30 years ago from a formal point of view mm. to think um, that there were two sisters who spent their time reading this esoteric book by a Cornell professor about hyperbolic crocheting. Right, and one sister's and, an artist, yeah. the other sister's a mathematician. And they would sit and binge watch television and crochet coral reefs. And that's what they're doing. They're binge watching every episode of Sex and the City and so on. Yeah. They make the coral reefs, and then people all over the country and the world make more coral reefs. Right. So to me, that's like almost a made-for-order example of, the, of what we can do as critics now, right. which is we're seeking to look at rich ecosystems, yeah. and this is one of the richest. Yeah, I think it also goes back to what Otto von Busch was talking about, using your body as a jig, yes. and really beginning to yeah. think about how bringing bodies, multiple bodies together to have conversations and, and to, to accept the multiplicity of, of um, processes is yeah. really interesting. I think if there was just one crocheted piece of coral there, um, the analysis would be pretty boring. You know, you mm -hmm. couldn't get by with that. Mm -hmm. You have to have this whole richness of form. Mm -hmm. to make and the boring. system that allows it to proliferate, right? Because it's not only that they do them in different cities and invite multiple audiences in different cities together or, or um, try to get the math students of a university to sit yeah. with the art students, et cetera, but also um, that you know, you're invited to create your own satellite. You know, there's a whole system yeah. set up to create satellite um, 
pedagogical and conversational opportunities. And there are two things that strike me as being really interesting about this project as to potentially write about, maybe I will, who knows, um, is that it calls into question the idea of authorship, which is something that we talk a lot about in craft vis-a-vis -vis contemporary art and um, looking at kind of historical collective models of working with textiles, knitting, quilting bees, et cetera, yeah. um, the kind of distributed authorship, so to speak, of anonymous female uh, textile ninjas who created incredible works that are now you know, uncredited to the dark matter. The dark matter of, of quilts. There's, um, they're, they're everywhere. And the kind of uncredited labor that goes into a lot of contemporary art fabrication today. And there is, this is an example of something where both of those models are kind of tweaked and turned on their head, where the authorship is evident because people are sitting there working on it. There have been a couple of really interesting projects not unlike that. Sabrina Geschwantner mm -hmm. um, did a project called Wartime Knitting Circle that has a, had a kind of drop-in component um, that was really cool. And the Combat Paper Project is also kind of an interesting analogy for this, where it's sort of, um, vets working with um, kind of the, I think it's the remains of their, their uniforms, uniforms, right, yeah. that have been shredded and turned into, they can kind of create paper, sculpture, or, or drawings, or, or paintings. And so there's, an, uh, there again, it's kind of um, authorship and kind of creating a space for non-artist artists. You know, I also thought about the, the authorship that they're you know, again, what are we learning from the artists in terms of the models and the mm -hmm. strategies they're creating? I, I also think it's a challenge to say, well, what if I'm somebody who doesn't really know very much about climate change? Like, what if I actually co-authored with a scientist who knows something about yeah. that? Or is, you know, are there opportunities here to co-author with a mathematician to really get more about at the, the kind of abstraction of the parabolic curve. And if I'm a climate change denier, I make my coral reef really healthy looking yeah. compared to yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean, actually, that's funny because like some of these are made from plastic, right? Which is about... Like from the, is it actually from the oceans? Some of the plastic that they use? Well, they like just collect. It's trash. The, yeah, it's yeah. trash. So, you know, and that is the invitation to, if you're using that material, then let's talk about plastic gyres yeah. in the oceans today. You know, so, but it, it strikes me that it's also very much about um, thinking about how it's an invitation to challenge your own writing practice so that maybe you begin to think more kaleidoscopically on a kaleidoscopic project. So um, it, teaming up with people from other disciplines, thinking about how to, how to write it. I don't know if it would be in a dialogue or in a conversation, or if you actually sit there and say, yeah. like, what can, we, what can we make together? Yeah. Um, uh, so we have one last um, <laughs> wild card case study, study here. Uh, the Theaster Gates um, Dorchester House project. I'm just going to flip through these slides mm. just to remind all of you because this is one of those stars that is shining bright right now, and so I'm guessing that the name is familiar. Um, and also because his nonprofit Rebuild mm. um, did a project here in Omaha, but it, it first kind of came out of the Dorchester House in the south side of Chicago, um, where he purchased a home um, in a, you know a very uh, Low income, uh, you know, high crime neighborhood, uh, tremendous amount of murders, you know, the highest in the country right now going on in the South Side. So, um, how do you think about uh, renovating a house that you want to live in and work in as an artist, but that also becomes part of an, uh, the ecosystem of an entire community and, and neighborhood? Um, so, you know, when you think about the houses, um, I mean, it's not only that he chose to uh, revalue and sort of, re you know, redeem mm -hmm. um, used materials to bring into the, uh, to the house, but also, you know, to, to think about the workforce and how do you, how do you have um, excellent craftsmanship because you hire a top-notch um, uh, carpenter, but at the same time you think about like how could that be an opportunity for setting up an, uh, an apprenticeship mm -hmm. with people who need work in the neighborhood. So it, it is about um, really this thinking systemically um, so that you end up with something that's a really beautifully crafted interior, but it also be begins to be a space where you can get all kinds of things um, that you gather together that have been um, devalued, whether they're slides from the university, you know, the glass slides that are now considered antiquated and unnecessary from the slide library of the um, University of Chicago, or um, 
a, a bunch of uh, vinyl records that were going to be you know, given away or tossed or you know, that he brought in to create the listening room um, or the library of um, the black library, um, black cinema, et cetera. So it also begins to be a space mm. where um, lots of things that are discarded or devalued are revalued, re reinserted into an active um, kind of uh, community. And, um, and it becomes a space, again, for things to happen in. Um, not only for the people who are living there to live in, but also on occasion to open it up to multiple audiences to come and, and um, uh, have meals together, to listen to the Black Months of Mississippi performing, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm just wondering, that's my, I'm not gonna say much more about that, but I wanna know how do you guys, what would you feel is important to write about, um, and how can you be critical of this work? Uh, should I go first? You can, sure. I think it's, I mean, there's so much to say and it's so interesting, but I think one of the things that really strikes me about this, um, thinking particularly since we're here at uh, the ACC, is um, the way in which one of the techniques that keeps craft practice alive is this constellation of schools and studios that exists across the United States and many of um, the, the speakers, organizers, trustees are kind of affiliated either with a university or a, you know, sort of non-accredited uh, old prestigious craft school of some kind. And that I think part of what, a lot of these places are beloved and people go back again and again and they raise money and they do empty bowls and all this kind of stuff. And so I think that there's a piece of that in this, that, of that kind of having meals, having a project, having sort of a, a project that involves lots of different people with different kinds of skills um, kind of hanging out and the way that you do in a craft studio when things are being fired or you're just kind of hanging out and you get to know people and get to respect them and uh, see how hard they work and then really, you know, sort of want to either stick with it or support them in some way so that there's something about that's not object based but almost like ecosystem based in what he's doing that resonates in my mind with other kinds of craft communities. Uh -huh. I have the clicker. Could you or just click to the next? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I just I don't want to leave today or end in a couple of minutes um, with giving the wrong impression that we as critics are really nice people and we love everything, <clears throat> because there is room for <laughs> there is room for negative criticism. Yeah. And I'm a tremendous admirer of Gates projects as well. <clears throat> I just wanted to give you the thought that there are ways to look at it critically. Okay. So. Let's talk about what those are. Um, a, I think there is a great desire to have projects like this that you can sort of see on the surface and say, mm -hmm. wow, isn't this great? Yes. But how do you interrogate who are the people who are really benefiting from mm -hmm. this project? Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, like, Rather than saying, oh, it's saving the south side of Chicago, isn't it fabulous that a potter can come in mm -hmm. and do this? You know, I think that there's a way in which you've got to be much more specific about who are, who are the multiple audiences this is And serving, what's the outcome? And what are the real yeah. outcomes? And how are you going to learn that? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go and talk to people in the neighborhood. You're going to have to talk to, you know, not just the official uh, brochure of the PR thing. Also, you need to think about like how does this scheme, which is actually p now uh, part of a nonprofit uh, happening in other cities, how does this actually relate to gentrification processes in in various cities? So <clears throat> now you know the South Side of Chicago isn't yet gentrified, but you know there this is also part of a larger. Um, urban planning and urban development scheme that a lot of us live with the consequences of all the time. So I do think it's really important mm -hmm. not to let down your critical faculties when you're writing critically mm -hmm. and to really start to not just talk about the objects but to really interrogate the systems and the claims for the project um, and, and begin to understand more fully what is and isn't working in that regard. Yes, that's right. We have to look at, um, obviously, he has a healthy ego. He's interested in the traditional idea of a, a super artist. You know, he wants to be recognized for that. But at the same time, he's using that as a means to achieve an end. But how successful is he with that? I think those are the questions we have to ask uh -huh. as critics. Yeah. Or we're not doing our due diligence. Right. Which isn't to say you're expecting one artist to save the world. You know, I mean, you have to also, like, but I think that there are real questions to be um, uh, brought up and um, interrogated and, um, and 
you know, I don't see a lot of, there's not, really not a lot of writing about the limits of the claims. And it's also possible to be kind of bewitched by the aesthetics of it all and then kind of think, well, this might be, mm, maybe it's a little gimmicky or it's, it's not quite, you know, it, doesn't, it didn't sort of turn around thousands of people's lives in some permanent positive yeah. way. But does it have to do Does it have, that's the question. Lives. I mean, and that, that also becomes a question to grapple with, of like the success, is it a numerical thing? Is it a, what kind of impact? Or is it aesthetic? Yeah, is it artistic? Is it aesthetic? I mean, can yeah. you have ma many, many different kinds of criteria that you're analyzing and then deciding what's important to you to write about? Yeah. You know, I'll have to admit, when I look at a project like this, I feel overwhelmed as a critic. I have my own a particular lot. focus. I'm yeah. focused on glass. Mm -hmm. And I look at this, and I want to write about it. But slides. I, you can write about the glass slides. Right. You know, maybe it goes back. We talked about the fact that we as critics are not collaborative enough. When I look at something like this, I think I need a team of four or five critics working together to try to analyze it. And you know, that's something that I think is absent from our community. Yeah. Um, I think almost in the nature of criticism is we all are a little bit standoffish towards each other. We don't yeah. really have a model for it. We, we don't, don't really have a kind of studio of model yeah. for, for critics. I mean, that actually makes me think of one thing that perhaps is a, a place to end. But you know, there have been very few opportunities for critics to actually have, um, and I was lucky to have one of them that Americans for the Arts enabled through a grant, of, of working on a project through cross-disciplinary means. So I was working alongside an anthropologist, artist, et cetera, and we were involved from the very beginning of a project like this to say, how do you think through your own disciplinary lens and through your own bodies of knowledge and your own secret knowledge and everything else that you carry with you, but um, how do you then um, talk about what you're seeing or where your blind spots are, mm -hmm. right? And how do you help each other find your blind spots so that ultimately um, you actually are sharing your writing as it's going along. And uh, so, you know, I, I think there are great opportunities for fellowships to be developed. Oh, yeah. That enable Definitely. critics to actually sit alongside people who are involved in the systems that artists are pointing us to mm -hmm. and actually ha and kind of thinking through our own disciplines yeah. with that as the focus in mind. So I, I'm hoping there's more things so you don't have to, I mean, the overwhelm is a good thing. Yeah, right? it is. But it helps to have uh, strategies for coping with that and for seeing it as an opportunity rather than a hindrance. No, right. I love the messiness of the world right now. Yeah. You know. Well, should we end on the messiness of the world? Thank you very yeah. much. And <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.